I was told for one sermon I was all uneven, so I'm trying to fix it before I get started. Shana Tova, Gemar Chatima Tova. Over the last six or seven months, I have become expert in a subject I never expected to be. In fact, six months ago, before March 16th, I did not even have my own Zoom account. And yet, I have done Zoom baby namings, Zoom funerals, Zoom shivas. I've done Zoom wedding meetings, Zoom weddings, Zoom board meetings, three times Zoom brisses. I'm not going to tell you how that happened. And one time I was downstairs, Jessie was upstairs, and I Zoomed her so we could figure out what we were going to have for dinner. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time on Zoom, as I suspect many of you have, and I know that today is a somber and serious day, but if you would give me just a moment of lightheartedness, I'd like to tell you how all big Zoom calls begin. They start roughly like this. Hello, can you see me? Oh my God, there are people here. Can they see me? One person's on the phone with someone else in another box. One person has three boxes, all of from themselves, and it's highlighting back and forth, and you hear a loud screeching. One person's on the phone with their doctor sharing way more information than everyone else needs to hear. And then five minutes or so in, I press the all-powerful mute all button. I'm considering seeing if we can install one at Shul. <laughs> And the call begins. And besides the sort of humorous way, besides it is so consistent that uh, when I meet with families before an event, I tell them that's probably how it's going to begin, it's been sticking with me. And as I was getting ready for the ho High Holy Days, I realized that partly it sticks with me because it represents how I'm feeling spiritually religiously, theologically. God, can you hear me? Can you see me? Is this even working? A few months ago, a congregant uh, called me up and said, you know, Rabbi, I just, in these times, I wish you would do a sermon on why bad things happen. And I thought to myself, okay, and I did a bunch of research. I taught, not only did I do a sermon, I taught a class on the subject. The congregant came to both, and after both were done, he looked at me and said, great class, great sermon, Rabbi. I just wish you'd do a sermon on why bad things happen. Which was tough at first. Uh, but then I realized that there is no full answer. There's nothing to say there's no way that it's going to suddenly this all makes sense and it fits and it's great. If you're like me, you feel far away. You feel socially and spiritually distant. So this Yom Kippur, I want to suggest three ways we might connect spiritually. Three ways we might find God by unlocking holiness, by the concept of process theology, and by acknowledging the God who knows. There's this Kabbalistic idea that when God creates all of existence, that each thing, each item in existence gets imbued with godliness. And when it's used for its true purpose, for its most holy purpose, that godliness is unlocked and shared with the world. And the world gets a little brighter. An example might be your grocery list. There's nothing more mundane. It's a piece of paper you check off as you go. But imagine in these times if underneath your stuff, you put a list of stuff your elderly neighbor needs who can't go or is afraid to go to the grocery store. Suddenly that list becomes not just the way you make sure your family has food, but also the way you take care of your community, your friends, your family. Or our phones that seem to be glued to our hands. Normally they are a distraction, but could we use it to reach out to our family, our loved ones, our community members who might not have other points of contact? Suddenly that device becomes godly or shovels. 
In the last few months, they have again, uh, again been allowing graveside funerals. But the cemeteries still don't allow you to use their shovels for fear of transmitting the virus. And so I tell families, if you'd like, you can bring your own shovel. And families sort of dig in the back of their garage behind four other things and boxes they haven't opened since the last time they moved and they find the shovel or it's in the trunk behind the emergency supplies. And they come and the, the service is always hard. And it's the worst part when you get to the end and you put the dirt on the coffin of your loved one. And then something happens at the end of the service. I watch families pick up that shovel, the thing that earlier today they weren't sure they owned. And now they're not sure what to do with it because suddenly it's not just a shovel. It's the thing that allowed them to show honor and respect to their loved one. It is the thing that unlocked godliness and holiness for them. One thing we might do when we feel distant is to look around us and say, what can I use these things for that would be holy, that would be godly? There is a modern theology called process theology. Uh, there's great books written about it, and another time I could teach an eight-session course on the subject, but for today, just a moment. It begins with Moses climbing up the mountain, and he sees the burning bush, and he's in awe, and he takes his shoes off, and he bows down and says, what do I call you? And God answers from the flames, Eheye asher eheye. Usually translated as I am that I am. But the thing about biblical Hebrew is it doesn't follow the same rules as modern Hebrew. And it's not really past, present, future. It's imperfect or perfect. An action completed or not yet completed or ongoing. And these words are imperfect, which means that another way to translate this sentence is, I am becoming that which I am becoming. It is a concept of God that imagines God is alongside us. And that as we become more and more ourselves, so does God continue to become. As we feel anguish, God feels anguish alongside of us. As we feel pain, God feels pain. As we feel blessing, God feels blessing. And to understand what that means for us at the moment, I need to talk for a minute about teenagers. I've run a lot, uh, the teenagers in the room just looked up like, oh. <laughs> I've run a lot of teen programming in my past, and there's a thing that happens sometimes. You go, uh, and there'll be this one teen who like, does everything right, like just a model teenager. They invite everyone to participate, they're enthusiastic, they're kind, they're polite, please and thank you. And the event is close to the end and their parent shows up and then a demon inhabits that teenager and they turn to their parent and say, what are you doing here? It's five minutes early. You're always embarrassing me. What's the matter with you? And sometimes they look back at me and say, thank you so much for a great event. And what's the matter with you and what are you doing here? I saw it happen often enough that I asked a therapist friend. I said, what's, what do you think is going on here? And she said, sometimes... What happens is it's so hard to be a teenager. There are so many pressures, there are so many emotions and feelings and things going on that to be your best self is exhausting. But there's two people, your parents, who you know no matter what, they're going to love you. So when they show up, you let it go. You let your brokenness show you let the fear and the frustration, you dump on them all of your negative feelings that you were holding on to, and you just let the demon out. That's what process theology means for each of us. That God is that one. The psalmist 3,000 years ago, the person who wrote the psalms, uses a phrase repeatedly, Ad Matai. It means how long, until when? How long will the good people suffer? How long will the wicked get rewards? How long will this world be so broken? It is the same idea. 
one way we might interact with God is to let our brokenness show, our frustration, our uncertainty, our rage, because after you let it go, God will still be there. God still says, I love you. The third way comes from a piyut, a liturgical poem from Friday night called Anabakoach. At the end of it, God is referred to as the knower of secrets. The idea is, is that everything we've ever done, every part of ourselves, every thought we've ever had is laid bare before God. And at first, honestly, if you're like me, that's terrifying. The part of ourselves, that thing that we try and show no one, God already knows. That thing that we're embarrassed about, that we think about when no one else is around, the thing that we just hope no one ever sees, God already knows. And here's the thing. God's still waiting with open arms. God still says, it's okay, I forgive you. It's okay, I know this year you want to and you're going to do better. I'm here for you. This Yom Kippur, I think many, maybe even all of us, are feeling a little lost, a little broken, a little unsure, a little like the world exists where we would sit 12 feet apart from each other at shul, and that doesn't make any sense. So I hope that we can look around ourselves and find the objects in our world and unlock their holiness. I hope that we can let ourselves be as broken and unsure as we are in front of God and hope we can remember that that thing we're not proud of, God knows and is ready to forgive. Because there's one more thing that happens in Zoom calls. When we talk in person, when it's time to say goodbye, there's like a few seconds of walking away, you can wave. But on Zoom, when you hit that button, it disappears instantly, it's gone. And usually, often at the end, no one's quite sure when to press the button. Do you leave? Do you not leave? And what's happening is we just want that connection so much. We're afraid to let it go. We're afraid to be the one to hit end. So this year, I'm here to tell you that even though the connection seems distant or maybe even invisible, if we dig deep, we can make connections with each other, with our tradition, and if we're real lucky, with God. Shana Tovah.